Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Y Charts. There was an article in the journal over the weekend. The ProShares Ultra Pro QQQ has become the most actively traded ETF this year. More than 119 million shares change, hand, ha, change hands on an average day, up 65% from last year. Jeez. But I thought people don't listen to us. Didn't we say no? We said no. All right. So you pulled up this chart of AUM from Y Charts. And I just added a little bit to it because so you showed the assets going back and it, this thing really skyrocketed since 2020. It got to a high. I like the the max and min and average values you can put on charts from wine charts. So I put good the, feature, good feature. I put the max. You in know here. why? Because we're like we're sort of squinting. We're like, what is that? Plus, right. It's more fun to talk about stuff from the highs and the lows. It just is. That's like cherry picking. But so this thing had over twenty two billion dollars, and even though the it's gotten crushed lately, it still has eighteen billion. That's a huge number for for an ETF like this, right? Huge. What do you? Oh, didn't we get another? We got another email about the leverage ETFs this weekend. I can't remember what it said. What do you think the difference is between people who are trading this with all this volume and people who are actually having a long term holding in a leverage ETF like this? I'd say opt, I'm going to be I'm going to be optimistic here. I'm going to say it's ninety percent traders. Would, Maybe that's high. I would imagine it's still a huge, huge number. Uh, anyway, if you want to play around like charts like this, remember we're still having our deal with Y charts where you have the whole month of April. If you, if you reach out to them, and until April 30th, you get to try Y charts for free for a month. And then after that, if you decide to become a paying customer, you get 20% off of your initial subscription if you tell me Animal Spirits sent you. One more thing. Look at this chart. Retail investors' net purchase of leveraged ETFs. They won't stop. They're relentless. They keep going. All right. This is retail from Vandetrack. They keep going. Hopefully, people are doing so responsibly, right? But I'm guessing they're not. <laughs> All right, welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. It is our 250th core episode, meaning just straight up the Wednesday. The Wednesday episode, 250. Does it feel like more or less? That's about right. I would say directly even. I'm feeling good about that. Holy smoly. Wait, how is that possible? So we started in November 2017. Remember all the so double up episodes up on... we had, though, during the oh. pandemic? How many months did we do that for? Two or three months? Too many. I was, I was getting burnt out towards the end. Yeah, you're the much. one who wanted to stop. Uh, it was too much. Yeah. So we've lived through a bear market in 2018. It was kind of our first one for the show. That was a that was a minor bear market in the grand scheme of things. The corona crash in March. And now whatever this thing is, which is either- What are we calling this? Well, it's either a dead cat bounce or it's some, 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 something to do with inflation, obviously. So I think yeah. the narrative has shifted because as price moves, narrative shifts. So if you look right. as of this morning, the S&P is down- less than 5%. The Russell 2000 is down 8%. NASDAQ 100 down 9%. At their worst, the NASDAQ, on a, this is on a year-to-date basis. The NASDAQ was down 20% at the lows. S&P was down 12 and change. And small caps were down like 14 on a year-to-date basis for 2022. I'm sorry, not to be beat a dead horse. I think all of these, those all need caveats, or at least an asterisk, especially the S&P needs an asterisk. These are the numbers. I'm just giving you the numbers. Well, and I'm just giving you the context, brother. Just because some crazy an asterisk. Just because some people pick stocks and they're getting killed doesn't mean there needs to be an asterisk on everything. Right? Okay. No, so wrong. Here, so here's the new narrative. This is this isn't a Bloomberg piece. And this is uh Nick Colas, who was on the Compound and Friends last week from Data Trek. Wait, is this a Nick Colas piece? Well, he was in Bloomberg. They they talked he said Oh, oh. Um, he's saying that like seeing the tenure rise is actually healthy because that means the economy's improving. But this piece was basically saying, wait, wait, wait. Yes, inflation was thought to be bad, but actually maybe it's good for corporations. Oh uh, yeah, let's hear it. Okay, so so they're basically saying, and Nick Cola said actually, uh, stocks kind of kept up with inflation in the '70s. So this is I looked at this recently too. And it is kind of funny that everyone got all bared up right before the markets ripped higher, and who knows, debt cap bounce, whatever. It can Guilty. Happen. So look at this margin. Piece. Look at this margin piece. He was with with you and Josh. He was talking about how companies have a ton of room for for taking sort of price shocks and and maybe benefiting from them. So look at margins are still at or near record highs for the S and P, uh, close to thirteen percent. Remember when this was supposed well, to be the one the one data point that everyone said this is this has to be mean reverting because of capitalism and it just continues right. to go up. Well, we learned that's not true, but actually maybe inflation was like the guise under which. Uh, corporations could fatten their margins even more 
and think that people wouldn't notice. No, no, no. We notice. We notice what you're doing. We know that inflation is up six, but, but we don't 7%. care. But if you're no, we notice. We do notice that your prices are up eight or nine percent because it shows up in the margin data. Right. Shame on you, Kroger. Okay, but here's the thing. So the 1970s, profits on the S and P were up 10 percent per year in the 1970s. Obviously, that's on a nominal basis. So take out inflation, profits still did okay. So corporations could keep up. Stocks did 6% per year in the 1970s. I know it seems like the worst uh, decade ever, but 6%, obviously, inflation at 7% meant on a real basis you were falling behind, but stocks as an inflation on, hedge on, can keep up. Context guy over here. I believe that the Dow did much worse than the S&P because I think at the time the S&P was, not mostly, but I think the biggest sector, and I could be way off, but I, I think the biggest sector was financials. Oh, come on. You can't use the Dow as a context. That's 30 stocks. The S&P is much more diversified, even though they get the same returns. <laughs> are we kidding or are we serious? We're serious. Who, who, listen, who watches the Dow? No one uses the people's, Dow for it's context. A, it's the people's index. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need to contextualize the S&P with the Dow. No, no, no. The, dude, the 70s were horrible for stocks. I'm saying they weren't as bad as you think. So there was the 1973-74 bear market where stocks fell 50%. I don't believe you that stocks did 7% a year, 6% a year during the 70s. They did. I'm going to call bullshit. No. Okay. 6% per year for, for the U.S. stock market from 1970 to 1979. And Which that, U.S. stock market? That's with- Which U.S. stock market? S&P 500. That's with a 30% drawdown at the beginning from 1969 to 1970, and then a 50% crash from 1973-74. So, you know the uh, Ron Bergen and DGF, I don't believe you? I'm just throwing it out there. It's true. So I'm saying, so this is the new narrative shift that actually inflation is way worse for bonds. So money's going to pour into stocks because it has to go somewhere. And so if all the money doesn't flow out and go into commodities or something, the stock market is, could be the beneficiary. That's the new narrative. Obviously that, that narrative is driven by prices rising 10% in a week and a half or whatever, but it's honestly not the worst. That's one of those things where you can't say this is bullish for stocks, but you also can't say this is ridiculously bearish. Because stocks, you, if oh yeah, let's say stock, let's say inflation does stay up and it's it's at six seven percent for the next couple of years. Let's say we get in that situation where it's really going to stick around and wage we get this wage spiral or whatever, and commodity prices stay elevated because supply chains don't get fixed. That's not a that's not bullish for stocks, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be bearish. What if in two weeks uh, interest rates have stabilized and stocks roll over? What are we going to say then? Well, then we change the narrative again. That's how this works. <laughs> Price drives the narrative. <laughs> I, I'm just saying it doesn't – people think immediately inflation has to be bad for stocks. You know what inflation rate was in the 1980s when the stock market did 17% per year? It was high. It was almost 6%. Yeah. I mean, the, it was coming down most of the decade, but it was still really high. All right, so right. JP Morgan put this out, and they said – I mean, they're guessing as much as anyone, but if this is not a recession – the stock market pretty much bottom. What's the guy's name? Michael Semblist, who always has the really good yes. pieces and charts. Uh, Huge fan. He looked at the difference between a correction in a recession, and he looked at the SP 500 and Russell 1000 and 2000 and all these different NASDAQ 100, and then if it's in a recession. So basically saying if this was not a recession, that correction we just had is probably pretty close to average, and we may have seen the bottom. If this is a recession, all bets are off and could probably go much lower, which I don't know if that's cold comfort to anyone because – of course, if we have a recession, stocks are probably going to fall more. Uh, I don't like saying this, and of course, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm not bullish right now. Let's just say that. Okay. My thing is, you don't have to be bullish or bearish. What if you're kind of just in the middle? What Kind of like- Well, I mean, practically, I mean, if you look at my portfolio, I'm, scream, I'm a screaming bull. True. That, needless to say, I'm always positioned for a screaming bull. But- How do uh, NFTs well, perform if there's a recession? Uh, well, actually, NFTs held up great during the latest decline. But my point is this. Yeah, of course I'm in the middle. I mean, I don't actually know where the market's going. I don't think anybody does. I'm not foolish enough to say that I do. But if you ask my opinion, was at the bottom, I'm suspect. Yeah. I, I think it feels more likely that that wasn't a bottom, even than like the March 2020 bottom. Like that to me, like felt like that was a bottom. This, it's like- eh. I just, I still think there are just so many headwinds. Now, Counterpoint, so does everybody. Yes. That's, right? that's the thing. Every, everybody thinks they're a headwind. That's the thing. It seems like everyone. And here, I feel like the take machine since the war has really ramped up. So here's, here's what I've heard from the take machine over the last couple of weeks. Globalization, done. Over. This war has ended globalization. Countries are going to hunker down and say, we're going to produce our own stuff. We're gonna, everyone else, screw you. We're doing our own thing. 
the dollar's reserve currency status is over, right? This this proved it. Nobody, nobody, no, 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 that's not a serious take. I, I, serious oh, I've seen that. a lot of serious math. I mean, I've seen shit too. I've seen some crazy stuff too, but I'm not. That's, you, okay. know, you can't throw that out as a take. Okay, I've seen I've seen plenty of. Here's the thing. Every new generation of macro take artists for the last 70 years has had to say the dollar's reserve currency status is done. It's only a matter of time. That's just what you have to Are do. Are these your internal takes? Are these your internal takes? Prove that you've seen these takes. I saw – I'm not going to name names. There was a huge piece by a few people. They may be in the crypto realm saying that was it. This, this strikes the end of the dollar's global reserve currency. There's, these are serious takes. Here's the other. Here's another take. Commodity prices. That, big- no, no, no. Those are not serious takes. Those are absolutely not serious takes. I think that there are people who believe this because I've seen some Substacks now refuting them, saying, "No, no, no. You can't say the dollar's reserve global reserve currency status is over. That's that's crazy." All right. What else? What else is in the take? Commodity machine? prices are screwed for the rest of the decade, right? Oil, oil at two hundred dollars a barrel is is, is coming. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say like famine in parts of the world is coming. These are the these are the takes. Now, some of these things, especially in the short term, like are like the the part about food and stuff is is a potential. I think the it's kind of like uh, government debt. People have been for a hundred years have been saying U.S. government debt is too high, and it's like a crisis is right around the corner. So I, I feel like that's the kind of thing, just like the the global reserve currency status, where you you go with history and say I'm going to bet that it's not going to not going to the end. With the I don't think some of these takes even need to be refuted. Some of them are true. so obviously. But the, the thing about people saying okay. Commodities are screwed. We're, we're 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 stuck. The supply chain stuff is here forever. I think that's a bet against human innovation and capitalism, and that's the thing to me that seems it. It seems like we are in such a hard spot right now with all this stuff, the supply chain problems, and potentially countries hunkering down, and the war obviously making it even worse than it already was. I feel like that's just a bet against innovation and technology. Not really. I don't think so. Can it get better before it gets worse? I mean, can it get worse before it gets better? Yes, but I'm saying the people who – it's like people are extrapolating now that this the, these problems are going to be here for a long, long time, and it's going to be hard to ever get out of them. And I think that is – that goes against human history and our ability to solve problems. Well, I mean, inflation could be here for a long time. Supply chain issues could be here for a while. My point is, I think we figure this stuff out sooner than later. Good. I hope you're right. All right. Sorry. So you think all of my points here are straw men? I just think like uh, this. You're like. I mean, I know. I know. I know, I know what you're doing. Okay. I'm, I'm just, wise to you. I'm just. I feel like every new generation of macro take artists has to have a take like this and be like, "This is it. I'm. Pu- I'm pu- planting my flag. It's Here's over." Here's what's correct. Anytime we see a correction, the the pessimistic takes heat up going to overdrive. Yeah. And I guess, is that what you're saying? And my problem with it is a lot of these people are almost like putting these takes out with a grin on their face and like hoping it happens. That's the thing that irks me. Like, it's okay to say like, here's data and here's why this is bad. And this, this may get worse as opposed to people who are almost cheering on. Like, I That's want that. to follow. Happen. You got to follow the thoughtful bears. They're out there. There's not many of them. There's they're out there. All right. Really? I think thoughtful bears? You don't follow any thoughtful bears? You think every bear is crazy? Most of them. 95%. Perma bears. Well, the people, the, the, yeah, the people that are obviously, that are, the people that are calling for a perpetual 50% crash, yeah, obviously those people are, don't, you know, don't pay them any mind, but they're, I think they're thoughtful bears. All right. Uh, what's Sam, what's Sam saying here? Okay. What's his chart? He, he, not bullish, but uh, not bearish again. This is, Sam Rowe put this chart in here from Goldman. Households have accumulated around 14% of a year's spending in excess savings with almost all saved in checking and savings accounts. So this shows how checking and savings accounts have, have got – they, they show this piece This Joseph Briggs from Goldman says, uh, we estimate that around 70% of excess savings are held by the top two income quintiles, but lower income households also ha- hold a meaningful share, suggesting that spending from excess, excess savings could help offset decline in real income. Basically saying people have hunkered down so much over the last couple of years that even if inflation stays around for a little while and wages are not growing in real terms, people can handle the hit right now. Well, that's why it's hard to get too bearish because the corporation and the consumer are both in pretty phenomenal shape. Right. It's, it's, I guess it's just... Is there, if there was some other sort of geopolitical or macro shock right now, I feel like adding something else to the mix makes it even harder. 
I think a lot of the bad news was priced in. We need a catalyst, I think, I think, to send stocks slower. And I, again, I don't want that. I don't think anybody wants that. Um, I don't know. All right. What I do know is that bonds are getting massacred, relatively speaking. Uh, Jim Bianco had a great thread showing that if the month were to end here, it would be the worst month for bonds in, I don't know, since, since 1980. It's been a while. Uh, the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Bond Index uh, shows a negative total return of about 11%, which comes to $2.6 trillion. That's the biggest bond market decline. Obviously, the bond market is much bigger today than it ever has been, but it's the biggest dollar decline by a long shot. So I was looking at TLT the other day. I, I was doing a piece on, like, what does a bond bear market look like? Because some people think that, like, bonds are going to crash, and if interest rates rise, then they're screwed. But that, that's a short-term phenomenon. You talked about this last week, too. If, if rates rise, eventually those rates help pick you up and then dust yourself off. And over the long term, that's actually a good thing. But TLT has been around since, I think, like mid-2000s, like 2004-ish, call it. The worst drawdown ever happened in 2009, right coming off the bottom. Like So we bought a bunch of people poured into bonds, of course. Interest rates rose. Bonds sold off. And I think TLT was down. Again, this is the 20-plus year government bond. It was down like 24%. Right now, it's down 23% off the highs. So this is closing in on the biggest drawdown ever for long-term bonds over the you know last 20 years or so. You got to use the meme bond. The meme bond is what zero that? Z. Oh, zero coupon. That is... That is a favorite of yours. 30, well, because that's where all the juice is. 32% off its highs. I mean, that's a full-on crash. So that's, bonds. yeah, that's zero coupon, meaning that's your fullest of full duration risk that you can get. All of it. Third, down 32%. That's a pretty good crash. Yeah. You buy her here? <laughs> of bonds? <laughs> of zero coupon bonds? Uh, if you think rates are going to go lower. This is the thing, though. People predicting the end of the world and inflation getting out of control. The end of the world actually happening and going into a global recession is the cure for that. Yeah, I mean, th then we could cut rates. Exactly. So here's the thing, though. So f the, over the weekend, five-year Treasury yields went above 30-year Treasury yields. So I think it was like 2.6% and 2.5%. And that's an inversion, and, and I, don't, I think it's still pretty close today. What if we get to the point where the Fed says, oh, we're going to hike and hike and hike? They never even get to the point where they get to hike, and the market does it all for them. And they don't actually get to cut rates very much because they don't get high enough before the proverbial excrement hits the fan. Here's a good quote. Uh, I forget who said this, so I apologize. Uh, the Fed is now likely in a tighten until something breaks mode. The key question remains whether it's inflation or growth that breaks first. No, the Fed is going. Everyone's saying that they're, go they're going to 3%. Okay, I'm what if they don't, if so, if they're doing these 25 basis points, 25, like what if they don't have time to even get there by the time before what, breaks? before, oh, but you think you mean, you mean something's going to break before they even get to their terminal rate? Could be. All right. So my biggest inflation hedge that I talked about last week is already gone. I got an email from ButcherBox, as I'm sure you're well aware, food prices have been steadily rising over the past year. You might not know that our expenses for, for other factors like labor, fuel, and packaging materials have also increased substantially. The price of your beef and chicken box will now go to $146. I think it was $136 before, $139. That's uh, not so bad. They were behind the curve. I think so. By the way, we- What's we, in the box? What's in the box? You can choose either an all beef box, an all chicken mm -hmm. box, or chicken and beef, and then maybe one other thing. And then you can do add-ons. Can you choose actually, the cuts? They choose those for you. So it's kind of a, a grab bag when you open it. That's so fine. We, so it's, yeah- like they sent us, we just got one. Oh, a few here's days a liver. Ago. Yeah. Well, they gave us like a full chicken, a full, like a full, like, you know, a little rotisserie. What but, did you do with it? So we cooked yesterday. We grilled some chicken. We grilled some steaks. Very good, very good meat, actually. It's, it's, it's probably worth it. <laughs> That's good. it? Oh, I thought, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, you know what, you know what hedge is still in place? My 50 stars at Starbucks is still 50 stars. So I got that going for me. Okay. So I, I, I assume if they screw with those rates, people will riot. With what rates? If, if they say it, it used to cost 50 stars to buy, uh, oh, to get a free people coffee. People will riot. Yeah. If, if, they, <laughs> if they increase that, people, the Starbucks people will riot. 
So we had, uh, we've been talking, we were guilty of propagating uh, this, I guess, a nonsensical stat. You know that we've been saying uh, Ukraine and Russia and Russia are responsible for 25% of world wheat exports. I saw this, this thread too. So this people sent this to me. Okay. It's a good buster. So this person, uh, Sarah Tabor said, it's technically true, but it doesn't mean what people think. Missing wheat from the war is actually less than 1% of, global, of the global wheat crop. So when the headline is 20%, 25% of world wheat exports missing, that leads people to think, oh my God, we have to suddenly come up with 25% more wheat in the world. It's only 0.9% because most of the world's wheat is eaten in the country that grows it, which I kind of feel like a Muppet. Like that makes a lot of sense. Yes, it does. Where the, the actual data in the headline, this was a good, I'm, I'm always up for a good myth busting. This makes sense. Um, but again, I, you're still seeing a lot of people say like, this is, especially in, in third world countries, this is going to still be a problem and lead to like famine and upheaval and right. Like that there are still certain countries that are going to get hurt from this. Doomberg is a thoughtful bear. He ha- they have a post uh, out this week about the potential crisis that is staring us in plain sight with, uh, with food. And matter of fact, they explicitly wrote that they hope they're wrong. They hope that this does not come, come to fruition. Okay. Um, well, that, that's kind of like a, I know I'm going to be right, but I hope I'm wrong. Well, you have to, I mean, credit to them. You have to say that. Okay. You can't so, so like, I, I, I read, so that, that's cheerleading a, for a famine. That's an anonymous blog. I do have to take umbrage with one thing there. Uh, I don't think, I don't think I've ever done this. And if I have someone can shove it down my throat and shove it in my face. Uh, when bloggers say we, they, they talk yeah. in, the, in the Royal yeah. we, have you done but this Wait before? a minute. Th- th- that's the Leonardo I've, DiCaprio I've, uh, meme where he's kind of, you know, he's got his funny face. Where where you say we hope we're wrong, I yeah I know people do it. I mean, most people, a lot of people do it. But 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 what if there is actually a we? What if Doomberg is a group of uh, you know four traders or okay. writers or whatever? I, I do think that's a way to make yourself sound a little smarter than when you say we. But if what if like, it is a we? What if it's a we? What I think it's a team. I actually think it is a team. So just like your thing, like if someone gives you a macro take in a British accent, you be, you believe it like twenty five percent more. <laughs> if you say we in a blog post. I think, okay, this person is way smarter than me. Yeah. All right, this is from, this was interesting. This is from Calculated I'm going to search Risk. your blog for, a, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to search you for a way. Right. I'm going to get you. All right. I bring, I, yeah, it's possible. Uh, go back to like 2014. It might be in there. All right. Uh, in 2021, the highest level of education of the population, 25 and older United States, uh, 9% had less than a high school diploma. 28% had a high school to graduate as their highest degree completed. 15% had some college, but not a degree. 11% had an associate degree. 24% had a bachelor's degree as their highest. And then I'm a, I'm, I'm, you lost me. It's too many, it's too many numbers. What's the okay. point? Look at the chart. We've now got the highest level of people with a bachelor's degree or higher in history. It's like 38% have at least that or higher. Now look at this next chart. U.S. unemployment range with a college degree and high school, no college. You can see they both come down a lot. Uh, if you have a high school diploma, your unemployment rate is about 2.2%. If you just have a high school education, it's about 5% still. Wow. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that, so 38%, I'm guessing that number shocks people because we always t- hear about like the student loan crisis and all these things. It's still, it's still a minority of the country that has a college degree and has a college education. So more than, f- take the inverse, right? More than 60% of the people in this country, 25 or older, do not have a college de- degree. Hmm. I'm, I'm guessing that's a higher number than most people would assume. And it's still at the highest level ever. I'm but I'm saying the chart. fact that the fact that that's rising, young people's, we always talk about young people are so screwed because they have to pay higher prices for costs in college and all this stuff. Like, eventually, young people are going to have, their incomes are going to keep rising and rising. I don't think young people are so screwed. Higher. We were screwed. Us young people, and I'm not young anymore, but when we graduated in 2007, 2008, we were screwed. There were no jobs. Yes. That was, but but I, th- I think you hear a lot of that, that young people are screwed. Old people had the ability to buy houses at lower prices. And- well, there's some of that. There's some of that. But, well, okay, whatever. Um, this chart is wild, how low the unemployment rate is. Oh, by the way, you spoke about Nick Colix. We, we We did speak about this data set. You have to listen to that podcast if you haven't. For the Compound and Friends, Nick Colas was amazing. 
that he spoke about trading at SAC Capital with Steve Cohen. I mean, that guy is is just you know awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. Um, what happens to the number of job openings if we go into a recession? How quickly does that go from nine million to zero or whatever the number is? That's the big question. It's it's at its highest level. Here's the thing. Again, I said before the pandemic, it was seven point five was the highest. It's now at like eleven. So even if you took off four million job openings, you still get back to pre-pandemic level. But so you could say, oh, we could absorb it, blah blah blah. But what if that just like gets yanked away? I mean, you would think that that will crash I'm if we still do go into seeing- recession. Fifteen to eighteen dollar an hour at McDonald's signs. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't believe. I don't believe what you're saying. I don't believe what you're saying. You're seeing. You're seeing a lot of weird things out there. You don't see this too. I'm going to start taking pictures. You don't. Every time you go by McDonald's, you see a sign that says fifteen dollars an hour. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, how much um, does a burger? Co- I mean, a burger in New York probably costs that much at McDonald's because everything. I did get a expensive ludicrously there. expensive burger the other day. Don't ask. Okay. Um. All right. Nick That's the Majuli- funny thing about people in New York complaining about inflation. You guys Who's have the highest complaining. No, I'm saying people in New York generally. I'm saying it's like the majority of uh, finance writers live in New York already. It's like you guys have already had hyperinflation for the past 20 years. It's just Listen, going everywhere else now. I am happy. I'm not happy, but I am okay to swallow inflation if the alternative was a Great Depression. I know there. I know that there's a lot in between, and I think the Fed should have gone earlier. But listen, I was wrong about inflation getting to where it is. So way, I can't complain. I'm part of the problem. I will, I will accept I'm the inflation. standing up for my colleagues at the Fed. I don't think there's much the Fed could have done. I think this was a, this was a fiscal policy problem. I don't think if the Fed would have started raising rates nine months earlier, I don't think it would have, I don't think it would have mattered that much. They could have stopped acting as if we were in an emergency when we clearly weren't. Would you at least stipulate that, you freaking homer? I, yes, would, I'm just saying this was fiscal policy, pandemic, one and two, way down the list. They have stopped three. buying forty billion dollars worth a month of, of treasuries and mortgage-backed bonds a long time ago. Yes, but you're going to see interest yes, rates but. rising. Yes, but yes, but interest yes, but. rates are rising, yes, and it's not impacting the housing market at all yet. It will. Maybe mark my words. Eventually, mark it. It, sh- it should. It might not for a little while. All right, Nick Majuli wrote a blog post when the optimists are too pessimistic. And I've been thinking about this. He wrote, the common cultural fear is that you're going to run out of money in retirement. And this is, this thing that Nick is writing is clearly for a select audience, right? Of people that are fortunate enough to accumulate millions of dollars. But I've been thinking about this. What is the point? And I understand you have to save for a rainy day, okay? But what is the point of dying with $12 million? You're preaching to the choir. Same page? Yes, definitely. Enjoy yourself. Spend it. Let and let people that you love enjoy it with you. That's yeah. my take. So there there are all sorts of competing. Or, or ideas, give it away to some people. And you have to, you know, save for a rainy day. But assume you've gotten past that. I just don't understand the point of horny. And I think a lot of this comes down to psychology where people are paranoid because of their early childhood experiences. And, you know, I get it. But like, I don't know. You can't, you can't take it with you is all I'm saying. Sometimes the things that make you successful and make you a good accumulator of capital make it even harder to get rid of it. And we've talked about this with, with Chris, uh, who works with us and is our head of wealth management, has had numerous conversations with, with our clients, like urging them to spend money. Yeah, a lot of people have and a lot of anxiety. It's like, yo, you've got more money some, than you could possibly spend. Yes, I, I think there is a cycle. And some people would scoff at that and say, that, that's ridiculous. But it's kind of everyone has their own thing. And I, I certainly see how that could be the case for someone. Um, all right. Len Kiefer did this chart. Uh, Wait, didn't you want to say Nick's, Nick's example here? I thought I did. Oh, what did he say? Michael Kitsis did an analysis on the 4% rule. He found that the 4% rule in a 60, 40 portfolio, uh, which is 30 years of depletion of wealth. were more likely to have four times your wealth than deplete any of their principal after 30 years. There you go. Should be the 13% rule. Basically, well, basically just saying people, so many people worry about the downside, but the, the upside risk is, is also there for most people. Like for most people, it's not the worst possible outcome. Right. All right. So Len Kiefer has this, uh, this chart showing that although interest rates are rising, most American households have already locked in a fixed mortgage payment in 2005. And this was of course in the height of the dot com. I mean, the real estate bubble where everybody was taking out adjustable rates and stuff. Two out of five mortgages had adjustable rates. Less than one out of 100 recently. I think we learned our lesson. Maybe we learned it too good. 
So then Jake tweeted something spicy. Spicy take. At some point in the next few years, there will be the idea that an existing mortgage can be moved to a new underlying property because mobility will be so bad. So for example, if you have a two and a half percent mortgage, you're not you're not moving. Like you, you no can't way. move. You couldn't you couldn't pay me double my house to move right now. Maybe double. But I tweeted this out the other day in someone from London. I, I said people who have a two or three percent mortgage right now are never gonna move if rates are at five percent. There's right. no way right. unless they really have to. And this guy from London tweeted back at me and said, You mean you can't move your mortgage to somewhere else and change a loan? I said, No, why? They can do it there, he said. Okay, so then why can't we do it here? I need to learn how this works. But okay, back to the the rising rates hurting. So this Mike Simonson every week does a does a, a weekly thread where he one of the few threads I read. Because I, I'm sorry, with the threads, I just can't take it. I'm all if, out. If you have all a, out. 100% out. If you have a, th- a thread thing or a finger pointing down, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read it. Immediate sales are still through the roof, even though right, rates are rising. Uh, 31,000 of the 93,000 new listings last week went into contract essentially immediately, meaning they hit the market and boom, gone, snapped up. People are still, there's still a huge demand. This is interesting from Redfin. Their share of, and this is over like 200 Redfin users, or sorry, 2 million. Share of home buyers relocating reaches record high. So it's like basically one third of home buyers now are relocating. And this was as low as 25% as recently as uh, Q1 2019. Uh, so they say it's basically because remote work and also with home prices up so much, people are mo- are more willing to move locations to find a cheaper area of the country. Right. To, which actually makes so. It's kind of crazy. You think, okay, people are stuck in their houses, but also, if you're priced out in California or New York, New York or whatever, and you move to the Midwest, I'm moving to Grand you, Rapids. You'd be shocked. How, how would I? How would I do in Grand Rapids? Would I fit in? I'm Jewish. Yeah, we, we've, we've got some. We've got some New Yorkers coming here. Do you have, do you have any? Uh, do you have any Jewish people there? I have. I have shared office space right there for you. Um. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> welcome. Here's the, here's the other thing. The last time mortgage rate, I, I pulled this up in my charts. The last time mortgage rates were this high, there was there was well over a million homes for sale. How many are there now? 17? It's like 200-something thousand. It's I way, keep che- way lower. I keep checking my neighborhood, and uh, it's just junk. Of it's course. junk relative to the price. I'm not trying to denigrate anybody's By home. By the way, rel- yes. this, is how, this is how you can tell you're getting old. You, you don't need to look for a house, and you constantly check Zillow. I look at Zillow all the time. <laughs> Well, I get a weekly report. It's, I mean, I'm not on my app every day. But I'm saying, I'm interested. When you grow, when you grew up, you didn't care. Like now, if I like go to a new city, I'm like, eh, let's check out the old local real estate market here and see see some houses, <laughs> right? Like, and how much they cost and what they look like. When I was in my 20s, would I care anything about that? No. But now, when you get old, you start looking for houses on Zillow that you'll never buy just because you're interested in the local real estate market. Uh, I'm, so I'm saying we're we're old. We're going. That's true. We're going to Florida in a couple of weeks. Uh, Robin, Robin texted me, do you have any, uh, clothes for Florida? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. She goes, yeah, what? <laughs> I go, hey, you sent me a picture of yourself in some, a bathing suit the other day of <laughs> making sure the length was right. <laughs> Those were way too short. <laughs> really? I thought that that's the look now. Okay. They felt very short. I, like they felt quite short, uncomfortably short. Okay. But I but guess I'll, I'll try. Like- I'll try. Don't go to like a five inch inseam, go to like six or seven, but that's the look now. Okay. Listen, I want to fit in. All right. Don't, don't look at the houses in Marco Island. That, that'll, that'll blow you away too. All right. Here's, here's another take. Uh, comparing the median sales price to house buying power in all the 50 top markets reveals that four markets are considered overvalued right now. Overvalued is defined by a market where the median sales price is greater than the home buying power. Most markets are still undervalued. This I don't is, know this how is, they this calculate. Is, this is propaganda. I don't like it. I don't know how they calculated home power, the the ability to buy, but but, but you believe it. I I'm just putting it out there. There are some ways to quantify. Okay. All right, sure there are. All right, so what do we got? The so the most overvalued places are San Jose, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego. It's all California. New Yorkers in Las Vegas is right there. Um, Detroit, Michigan, way down on the list, still undervalued. It says. But, okay, this Detroit, was, this Detroit was, is a huge uh, buying opportunity. This was maybe this will get people off the side. So there was this speech by a Fed governor. Uh, what's his name? Christopher Waller. Time out. And it, can you trade housing markets on Calshi? 
not, I don't think they have any housing data yet. I've actually, I, I've asked for that. Like, I, I wanted to bet you on housing price growth this year. Maybe you should just give me a hundred bucks because whatever we'd have bet, I would have won. So <laughs> I should just give me the, some money. I should honor the bet that yeah. we did it make because I already lost. Pretty much. All right, <laughs> it's not going to do it. Not in this economy. Right. Sorry. He had a speech called The Red Hot Housing Market, The Role of Policy and Implications for Housing Affordability. And he talks in here, uh, he gives all these crazy stats. Who's hey? And who's he? Who's he? Christopher Waller, who's a Fed uh-huh. governor. But then he says, listen, I understand what's going on. You can read some of the stats here if you want. But he said, I understand what's going on. Uh, I am trying to buy a house here in Washington, and the market is crazy. Now, here's my the first thought that comes to mind. Why would a Fed governor be in the market for a house right now? He's been paying attention to this stuff for 18 months or however long. He knows what's going on in the housing market. He knows interest rates are higher. And here's, here's where it comes down to. He's like surprised. Like, huh, home prices really are high. Yeah. But here's the, here's the thing. Life events do not give a crap about interest rates or housing costs or what it's like. So some, sometimes people have to move because of a life event or because they need more space or they need to, a job or whatever. Sometimes people have to move. Right. Eventually, this, this clogged up housing market will get turning again because people will have to move. That's, right. that's my solution. Should we make one more plug for the NFTs? One more plug for the NFTs. Uh, we actually, I just want to say, go ahead. I want to say, I just want to say, like, to stop and think, like, how crazy the internet is. Mr. Target Date Fund guy here is now shilling NFTs. Uh, and that doesn't happen without the internet, right? I, I meet you over the internet. Uh, it also I, doesn't happen without the blockchain, sir. <laughs> true. The blockchain <laughs> solves this. I'm just saying how crazy the internet can be that it, it, it opens up these different opportunities and, I think it's I think it's a, it's it's a win for the internet. I know people like to talk smack about it. I'm also bullish on the internet. All right, so we had we <laughs> we, we had uh, Quinn Stearns from Audiograph on the show. That was actually a good conversation. We spoke about uh, leaving a, a comfortable job, starting a product, starting a business. Which characters we were in, we would have been in Silicon Valley. Getting said no to by us. We're we're tough tough cookies, but then but then coming around and saying yes. Anyway. You're bad cop. I'm good cop. Uh, so yes, the, here's, here's the, the NFTs thing are dropping I, I, on on Wednesday. Buy an NFT, please. Yeah. It goes to again. If you're listening for the first time, it's going to nokidhungry.org. Point one ETH, please help. And I'm gonna have a blog post. I think I'm gonna put on a Wednesday that's gonna explain everything and give all the benefits, and then we'll stop bombarding you with it. But but we we think this will be cool for people who are fans of the show and want a little bit more. Uh, my one question to Quinn that I thought was interesting. I guess essentially we were in a startup. You were, and you were there much earlier than me at Ritholtz. I, Ritholtz was a startup, effectively, but it wasn't like it was just an idea. And I that that always fascinates me to no end. How someone decides I'm going to quit this stable job with a good making a good living and salary, and I'm going to try to go for this idea. And the fact that we have so many people and young smart people, you got you and I are talking to a, a lot of startup founders lately. The fact that people just decide to do this in their 20s and take these risks. It's probably something I never would have been comfortable with. And I it it fascinates me that young people are able to do this and just jump with both feet and go for something like that. And we asked Quinn about that. And that 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 whole part of it to me, like that's when you want to do it in your 20s. I would have been way too much of a wimp to ever do that, I think. Yeah. Okay, we talked about Instacart last week. So they now went from they dropped their evaluation by 40. 40%, which is pretty big. I, I guess if you're that close to an IPO, you kind of have to, right? Because you don't want the expectations to be so high based on your last round. But that that's a, for a private company, that's a huge drop in value. I think also right? attracting uh, new employees. Like people know, hey, wait a minute. Am I getting compensated in stock that's 40% overvalued? No way. Is, that, is this also like the Fed though, where they're dropping it just so they can hopefully raise it in the future? Exactly. All right. They need to leave some juice for, yep. for new employees. All right. A couple odds and ends here. I want to mention, last week you asked me if I've ever been to a Total Wine before. And I said, no, we don't have those here. And dozens of people said, Ben, there's one on 28th Street in Grand Rapids. It's literally blocks from my office. And I've probably <laughs> driven by it 10 times. Easily. I've never gone in it. Uh, I compl- Right over my head, I completely lost it. But yes, Total Wine is a thing in Grand Rapids. I'm going to have to try it out because you recommended it. Did you it. visit it? Oh, not yet. No, I haven't okay. yet, but I, I guess I'm going to have to. Okay. Okay, here's a survey. Nearly half of millennials say they're living paycheck to paycheck, up 6% from a year earlier, a new survey found. With so little cash to spare, more millennial workers, those between 25 and 40, feel they can't handle unexpected financial expense. There's no way that's right. I call absolute bullshit on this one. There's no way. 
Half of all millennials are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. No way. Maybe half of Gen Z. And even still, it sounds high. I think that this may be a semantics thing of like the definition of paycheck to paycheck. Like I'm saving for my 401k uh, and I'm, uh, and, I'm yeah. and then I have nothing left. It's like, anyway. All right. I have an idea. So okay. I've been late to a few Zoom meetings and I, I really don't like it because I, I think it's incredibly rude when people are late. So not a fan of being late. Anyway, my point is this. You know, like sometimes this is 100% my fault because I set my timer for alerts on my Google Calendar to like 30 minutes before, which makes no sense because by the time 30 minutes passes, I forget. Yeah, I do mine, I do mine 10 minutes. Yeah, I think I, need to, I, need to, I think I need to switch to like a three-minute reminder, maybe five. Zoom should automatically pop up on your computer. The meeting should automatically open. That's true. Agree or or say like, do you, yeah, we'll give you the option to say your Zoom meeting is starting, yes or no. Yeah, it should automatically pop up. Here's what I learned. That makes sense. This is probably not news to anybody. Although it's news to me, so maybe it's news to you. When you schedule a calendar invite, you can hit the Google Zoom or the Google Meet, I should say, right in the invite. Did you know that? You could add video. Yeah, I did know that. You didn't. Eh, you, you looked up. I'm, I, I don't think you knew that. I, I, I was thinking if you're telling me something groundbreaking and yeah, I, I knew that. I don't think you knew that. All right. I, w- <laughs> I went to, I went to uh, the Nick game the other day. So my friend and I, who share a season, we share half a season. So we each get, I don't know, we go to most games, we sell stuff, it doesn't matter. We went to, we sold our tickets for the Wizards game, and we sat like fourth row. I've never sat close in Madison Square Garden in my life. It was just an amazing experience sitting that close. So then, like a week later, uh, it was a day before my birthday, two days after my dad's birthday, and I've never taken my dad my dad's been taking me to Nick games my whole life, like literally for 30 years, which 30 years, oh my God, I'm old, but we've never sat close. So I was on StubHub and I said to my friend, dude, this is ridiculous. I'm trying to buy good seats against the Hawks and it's a 25% service fee, 25%. I don't know how that the blockchain doesn't fix that and cut them right out of the equation. But anyway, my friend goes, hey, dummy. You, those are you have tickets to tomorrow's game. We have seats, and this is your turn to go. <laughs> and I said, "Oh, awesome! I'm glad I said something to you." By the way, blo- blockchain for tickets—that's the thing that everyone goes light bulb. Like, why isn't that a I thing don't know. yet? I don't know. I'm sure it will be. But um, okay, so I tried to. So I emailed my rep, and she said, "I'll upgrade you with like no, you know, no fees. Um, just let me know where you want to sit." So there was not a lot of seats available because Trey Young is a hot ticket, I guess. And I tried to sell my seats. I lowered them two times and I couldn't sell them. So I just said, eh, it's fine. I'll just, you know, my seats are good enough. I said to her, "Um, thank you, but whatever. So she texted me as I'm sitting down. I've got a surprise for you. Come meet me outside your seats. So my dad and I went down through the, the lounge, blah, blah, blah. We get onto the floor. And my dad's never been on the floor before. So we're like, oh my God. And then she takes us directly to like the best seats there. Di- like right on the floor, right next to Trey Young. He happened to be sitting at the end of the bench. And I, I was looking that night. I was just like, oh, how much are those seats? You were basically in like Spike Lee seats. No, no, no. Spike is on Celebrity Road. Oh, does he sit in the center court? Yeah. Okay. But you sent me your tickets and it was like, you were within feet of Trey Young. Like I, pr- I could have tapped his knee. So uh, they were thirty four hundred bucks a ticket, and I'm guessing nobody ever spends that much money. They're probably like like the suites at the the penthouses. At- and the best part about it is you were almost a meme because they showed a guy at the you, Knicks lost obviously. Yeah. There was a guy shaking his head, and you were sitting right next to him with your hand on it. And you looked luckily you weren't picking your nose or anything, and you were on TNT. <laughs> I could have been mad. So the guy next to me who you saw on TV said something to Trey. And by the way, there was a secure. So it was it was that guy, me, then my dad. And the security guard was sitting next to my dad. You can't talk to the players. Like, obviously, they don't let you heckle the players. So the guy next to me that you saw said something to Trey. Not so bad. I don't know if he said, you suck, whatever. Trey looked at him and, imme- and immediately, like, like, just instantly said, shut your fat ass up. <laughs> so so they the, needed the a guy The security guy goes like this to the guy. So they needed that security guy at the Oscars last night. So That's what they needed. You, I, we, I watch that live. You watch that live? Top five. Twitter nights of all time, easily. That tw- that's the kind of th- event where Twitter makes it a thousand times better, a thousand percent better. And honestly, I never would have watched it if I didn't have like ten bets on Kelsey for the Oscar winners. <laughs> <laughs> and so, 
I'm watching it and I go, I was doing my little uh, workout, you know, doing some sit ups, some lunges, kind of not, things, you know, not, not to brag. brag. Yeah. Course. And uh, I was about to take a shower, and I had the Oscars on in the background because I wanted to see who. And um, it's getting to the time they're going to do my bets. I'm like, oh, I'm going to take a quick shower. I'm like, oh wait, there's Chris Rock. I'm going to watch this part. I thought it was fake. I thought it was staged immediately. Then I go to Twitter, wait, and hang everyone's on. going. So two things on that. I also thought it was fake because first of all, Chris Rock didn't move even after, before or after he was hit, and he took a pretty, he took a shot pretty good, and, and he kept delivering. He kept going. But yes. when I, when I think when everybody was like, wait a minute, when they showed when, so, so the, the volume went off and they showed Will Smith yelling. And I think everybody at that point, at least me, I was like, wait a minute, is this real? Yes. Then I rewound and I was like, cause when Will Smith walked, I it too. when Will Smith walked back to his seat, he kind of had like a weird sort of grin in his face. You know what I mean? It was like very. Yes. That was the one of the strangest pop culture moments I've ever seen in my life. And how did Chris I don't Rock know if ever be topped? How, how did Chris Rock keep going? I'm guessing comedians are used to being heckled, probably not being slapped in the slapped. face. And and his his face like there was no mark on his face. Dude, what if what if he knocked him out? What if he got bloody? Right. What if he punched him instead of slapped him? Right. That was Could Will Smith have gotten arrested was, before his Oscar? If he, it if, was, Will, it was if, the if Chris craziest Rock moment. fell down and was bleeding, Will Smith would have been arrested immediately. But that's that's the kind of event that makes you appreciate and love Twitter more than anything because Twitter made that a hundred times better. Not only the jokes, but you had all these alternate angles. You had the videos. It was just an all timer pop culture moment, and I would have never done it. Someone tweeted us last week. I can't believe Michael and Ben gamble. Don't they know the house has the edge? If I didn't gamble, I'm not watching the Oscars last night. I miss an all time pop culture moment. So gambling is good. I. Uh, I popped on, by the way, Denis cleaned up, although he didn't win best director snub, <laughs> Denis cleaned up and I bet on during the, during the summer, I said, you know what? Let me hop on and let me bet against power of the dog. I just want a short power of the dog. I never saw the movie, but I hate that movie. I know I hate that movie. So I, I bought no. Uh, and of course I won. Yeah. I, I put a bunch of bet. I had some early ones. I bet on Coda at 13 cents, which means your upside is to a dollar. So look at this chart. Right? So look at this chart of Coda. That is very cool how you could see it building momentum. When did you buy it? Yes. I bought it at 13 cents in probably early March. Why? You saw because so you like saw a, it and you loved it? I can't remember what I heard it on saying like this is this is Coda is like the dark horse. I'm like, I'm gonna put some money. I put a little bit of money. It wasn't much. And I put a bet on and I loved that movie. I think people should get Apple TV Plus and get that movie. And that was the only decent movie out of all of them that probably could have should have won so that that was my thinking i actually and thought the ceremony it, but like prior to the chris rock thing i don't know what was different about but it, it was it was and the movie sucked it was a horrible slate of movies but it was quicker it was i liked like the the the, the pulp fiction i like the godfather obviously i like all like the 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 quick stuff that they did it was much more much more engaging the last year was like i turned it off this one was a lot more fun obviously all-timer well, yeah. moment yeah yeah true uh, real quick, they had a six month customer retention among select streaming platforms. Uh, Wait, what, do you, what, what did you just say? Customer retention for streaming platforms. Okay. Disney Plus at the, at the top. Remember, I said Disney has the biggest lock in because people rewatch stuff. Mm. That's why I think they hold on to customers more. All right. 31 year old investment advisor, really enjoying the content you guys put out. Wonder if you guys have any advice as a relatively young folks in the industry on mitigating the initial momentary flash of panic I imagine some clients feel when they first walk into the room and wonder, is this guy old enough to give me investment advice? Obviously, you build credibility by understanding their financial goals, blah, blah, blah. I know some folks are surprised when young folks uh, rolls in to talk about their investments, so I thought I'd ask you, sadly, I can't grow any much facial hair and rock the 5 o'clock shadow like Ben, and I am simultaneously cursed with a full head of hair, so I can't rock the wise, bald guy, Michael. Look, all right, first either. of all, shave your head, on, <laughs> shave your head anyway. That's true. You could do it. Shave your head. You'll look three years older. I remember I had one of the very first meetings I had. So I was with our colleague good friend, Chris, and he, we had a guy in his 50s walk in. It was one of my very first meetings when I joined Ritholtz. And the guy mentioned it. He said, wow, you guys are very young. And I, at the time, I was younger, but I'm also young looking, which is like a blessing and a curse. I still get carded sometimes, I swear. I don't. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Probably since uh, your 20s. But Here's my thinking on that. And the way that we answered that was, yeah, you're right. We're a little younger. Um, listen, we're, we're building financial plans for decades and decades, right? Not just a couple of years. Don't you almost want someone younger to be to working with you and see you along the way and maybe have people within your financial planning firm that have 
varying degrees of experience. And obviously, so obviously part of it is showing that you have the knowledge and expertise to, to put that together. But I think you have to spin it in a positive way as well. I mean, this person is a CFA, so I feel like that, that can't hurt. Um, but yeah, well said, Ben.